I'm here today with a really special guest. She is Frances K. Lankin. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And you're a psychologist. You've got all sorts of of qualifications in psychology and all sorts of specialties. I was reading through your biography before. I'm like, holy cow, I don't know where to start. <laughs> it's, it doesn't even sound like me when people um, people read that stuff out because I'm really just a person and I just am really interested in other people. Maybe as a defence mechanism for not, not analysing myself, I don't know. We can get to that. <laughs> before we started. It's just that fascination with an interest in people and what makes people tick. And because we're all out to, I don't want to say get the most out of life, but it also kind of is that, isn't it? (laughs) Well, I also, so, I mean, there are lots of games that we play in life and whether it's in the schoolyard or at home or in the office or whatever. And I'm okay with playing the game. I just want to know the rules and what the rules of engagement are. And, and I think that's probably what I try to do in psychology is to help understand what the rules are so that I can then play fairly and openly and, and I can predict how things are going to go. So I think we all kind of want, I'm not making a big assumption here, but I think we, we want a world that's a bit safe and predictable. And that doesn't mean boring and not spontaneous, but where you know people enough to know how they're probably going to react in situations and, and when things like that pop up. So uh, that's why I, what I love about psychology and what I, I try to do. That's really fascinating because I used to say to my kids, they they went to one of the old established senior school, well, schools. So they used to rail like all kids do against the rules. And I said to them, that's fine, but you need to understand why the rules are in place in order to then take that information and move forwards with it. You know, if you want to break them, Great, but you need to know why they're there in the first place and the impact that breaking them is going to have. That's right. Because it's all about, for me, it was all about understanding things from other people's viewpoints. Unless you can get in their shoes and see the world through their eyes, you've got no idea whether you're doing it right or wrong. That's right. It's going to have. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, I don't know if I'm just getting old and that's also highly possible, but I think, um, you know, I think when we're, when we're young, we do want to push the boundaries and, um, you know, and do things on our own and we don't want to, you don't want to stifle that. Um, but also you don't want to reinvent the wheel or go, you know, go backwards and, and redo things that have already been done or thought through or that are there for very, very good reasons. And so I think if we can set people's worlds up so that they know how to safely test the boundaries and and do just what you're telling your kids or suggesting your kids to do we can you know get get that new spontaneous exciting new stuff happening um, without letting go of the stuff that we need in order to you know operate and function we were just talking about maths before (laughs) (laughs) it's a good place to start i am obsessed with maths I love it as I, I don't like most of the in-between bits, but the dinner party and the couch sessions, I just love because that's when you see people, I don't know, the, the other bits tend to be a bit boring for me, but about half of my audience aren't in Australia, so we need to explain what maths is. I believe it has the Australian version has a bit of an international following, but uh, so maths married at first sight. It's a real. I'm going to put it in inverted commas. A reality TV show because I suspect it's not all organic. Where couples are matched together and they marry at first sight, and then have to and you know endure I guess twelve weeks in each other's company with various challenges to overcome, um, with the hope that they'll find true love and live happily ever after. Kind of like arranged marriages on telly and a modern family. That's yes. all it is. With with specialists help you get through them. But one of the things we were talking about before we came, well, I, I kind of brought it up, was that what we've noticed is the gaslighting of people. Right, okay, explain what gaslighting is first from a psychologist's viewpoint. Yes, so people may or may not have seen um, the movie in the maybe the seventies uh, called Gaslight, where the the premise is it's, it's that there's a male and a female in the movie, and the male makes comments and interacts with the female in a way so that she thinks that she's going a bit crazy and that there's something wrong with her by uh, because the way so she's picking up on stuff that's happening and she's becoming suspicious about what's happening and the guy is actually going no 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 you 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 know you 
you're crazy or you're being emotional, there's nothing nothing to see here and sort of turns it back around on her and her emotions when in reality he's doing exactly what what she's accusing him of doing. And so um, that's a really bad way of describing what's, you know, a good plot and a good movie. But the term gaslighting is, is sort of originated there and is now in, um, you know, in common society today just being used to describe uh, the way some people can manipulate um, other people's feelings and sense of self and sense of reality in a in a way that benefits them. Is gaslighting? I think there are extreme versions of it. I think we're seeing some extreme versions of it on uh, on mass. But being in a relationship, and you know, whether it's a work relationship or a private relationship or you know, a parental relationship, is all about trying to work out how to work together to get your needs met. And so I guess it exists in lots and lots of um, lots of forms. And I wouldn't necessarily say that it's really in its extreme form that it's that it's really problematic in that if if it's making the other person feel like they are unworthy, that they are that there's something wrong with them, um, that they are invalidated in expressing their thoughts and feelings and asking questions, and that they're being somewhat persecuted by the other person for doing so that's when it's really awful like it's just that and I think that's the gaslighting that we're talking about I'm not not saying any form of gaslighting is fine but there are other things that are called gaslighting that probably aren't which are you know just trying to get our needs met in an open and objective way like we might you know be trying to parent our kids in a certain way so I think there's a um it's that extreme end of the spectrum that's called gaslighting and there are lots and lots of ways in which we use relationships and interactions to get our needs met one of the things we both noticed on the or I noticed and you agreed with me on the maths is that the women are being picked up for gaslighting and there's one guy in particular who to account hasn't been held to account for what he's doing at all and it's latent extreme gaslighting (laughs) well and the irony is it irony the irony for me is that he's the one who's labeling the other behavior gaslighting gaslighting Um, yeah i think that's also a technique people use and i worry sometimes that you know um that you know labels can be very invalidating and can be a way to shut down a conversation and um and a defense mechanism so you'll see this person we're talking about he'll very very quickly jump to put a label on the behavior um when he doesn't want to engage in a you know in the conversation or, or thinks maybe that he's not winning uh, winning the argument or has something to answer for and we saw that happening you know in a very reasonable conversation um, that was going on between this guy and his wife where um, she was just asking for some empathy from him and, you know, he'd upset her and she was crying and he didn't go and, um, you know, and ask her if she was all right at any point in time. And rather than going, oh, crap, like, oh, okay, I didn't realise that's what I should have done. I made a mistake. I'm sorry, I'll try to do that again. He no, you're gaslighting me by making me think that I'm doing something wrong and I'm not. So it was a, and and so I think by labeling it, and that's a very powerful word to be using, um, he took the power back, um, uh, you know, and the dominance back in that conversation. And she had nowhere to go, got more and more emotional because it was very stressful. And then he sent, then he attacked her again for being emotional. I can't talk to you. I'm out sort of thing. So it was very, very awful and, and very blatant gaslighting to, to watch even though he was labelling her behaviour as um, as gaslighting. And I kind of, I know you don't, you were saying all the bits in between the dinner party and the, and the couch aren't as interesting, but they do provide that extra context around situations like that that then get called out on the couch. And so for me, it was interesting that that didn't come up in the couch, um, the couch conversation at all. And I wonder if sometimes it's a bit in, like these people um, who are very, very direct and, very black and white uh, with their thinking and there there are only opinions, by the way, but they present their opinions as facts and, uh, you know, very assertive about it. It can be quite intimidating to be on the other end of that. And so particularly if someone's quick to label behaviour and they're not engaged in a conversation um, around, you know, exploring your feelings, it's really hard to be in those situations. And so I just wonder if it's that approach that's making people um, less likely to call out that behaviour in such an overt way as we're seeing it done with the ladies on the show. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I I know somebody who does not as extreme as that, but if they're in an argument, they'll just go, oh, you're being stupid, shut up, shut up, go away, shut up, go away, and they will not engage. It's just literally shut up, go away. Yeah. 
that's their and there's nowhere to go in that collection. No. <laughs> no, and I so I, you probably picked up I talk a lot, I like to talk a lot. And you know, and and but it is so it, I don't want people to go say that get the idea that they have to talk everything out right to the very, very end, right in the moment. But there are different ways, there are lots of different ways to get everybody's needs met when you're having a disagreement or wanting to have a serious conversation. Um, and my hubby and I do do try to do this a lot, don't always get it right. But I like to talk, funnily enough, and I like to talk things right out till I've burned out all my energy and all my feelings in the moment. And my hubby just can't. He has, he, I've got all, he's got a limit of like 5,000 words a day. And once that's breached, he goes, oh, oh man, I can't, I just can't. So that's not gaslighting. That's just us trying to work hard to understand what I need in a situation, what he needs in a situation. And we now, you know, we'll get to a point where I'll be like, ah, and you're like can you just, I, I just can't hear anymore right now. Can you give me a day or, a, you know, a couple of, or can I talk about it in the morning with you or can I talk about it at another time? So you don't have to do it all when you absolutely necessarily need to, you, know, you feel like you need to do it all, but you need to be able to have that conversation about, well, when can we have that? When can we finish this off? And that's what I think building a, a good relationship is is about. Right, just extrapolating this from here on it. I mean, we can go into the usual, oh, they've obviously got some problems if they feel the need to do that. And there's a personality side of things. But one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was optimism and pessimism. Is there a correlation with that side of things, with the optimistic or pessimistic side and the way you behave in this situation? It's a really interesting question that I haven't thought about before. What have I been doing with my time? So are you you thinking that people with a more pessimistic view of the world might be less likely to engage in um, behaviours and discussions that get them the outcome they want? Is that? I don't know. It's just like uh, how does your personality as a whole and your general outlook in life, because if you want to do that gaslighting kind of manipulative shutdown of other people, is that because, well, are you more afraid of life? Probably almost certainly. But then is that connected to that? How is that connected to like mm. pessimism or ability to, to change? To your grow, yeah. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. So my first thought is that um, that it, it it is. I think often, you know, this is, I'm going to make some assumptions here, not knowing the person we're talking about at all and only oh, seeing what's being about- presented. <laughs> Let's just talk about your man on maths, like that. Yeah, that's if right. We talk about him because that's yeah, and so part. often um, that big, aggressive, um, powerful display of dominance comes from a place of, of insecurity, mm. and I and you know, and having to be the dominant person in the room, having to be right all the time, and if they're not, then that means something negative about them, and probably their you know their manliness or how they see themselves, um, and so. We, you can often find people who have big, bold, bolshy um, exteriors and it really comes as a, a bit of an overcompensation for what they're really feeling or what they're worried about might lie underneath. Now, whether they're aware of that or not is another interesting question or whether they're just, they've just built, um, you know, learned to build this, um, this facade and this way of relating that's really impermeable because of what it sits um, on top of or not. Um, and I think I do think we're seeing um, maybe a bit on maths, particularly, but out in society, a propensity for people to to not want to show vulnerability, and and vulnerability and being wrong and having to you know say sorry and take a step back is a sign of imperfection, and imperfection's bad. And I wonder to what extent things like reality TV and social media and filters and all of that stuff that we put out there about ourselves, you know, our ideal selves, our ideal versions of ourselves is perpetuating that a little bit, I wonder. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because as you were talking, I'm thinking about, um, you know, there's this reaction uh, wave that kind of started with Marga about the uh, about men's dominance, you know, the, there's the whole break down the patriarchy thing and men are going to respond and certain men are going to respond in a certain way. So there's this whole uh, wave of younger blokes in particular talk, trying to save what they perceive to be their manhood. And then you get mm. this kind of 
reaction from the guy on maths. It is it's in the same kind of boat, isn't it? So how do we it is and I well so if I may just interrupt I've just interrupted you anyway. <laughs> if I may. <laughs> um, <laughs> the other concern or the worry that I have is that not worry is that um, I'm loving seeing the the positive um, femininity and womanism and, um, you know, and I have much more of a clear idea for me about what it means to be a woman today than perhaps my mum did and and my aunties and, and, you know, and grandma did. And I feel like that's been, that's amazing. And I wonder if, if it doesn't have to be, but I wonder if part of that's been at the expense of, of attention on men and what it means to be manly and male in the context of of womanism and so it's not it doesn't have to be a competing thing where we can be unique um and there are lots of different things and ways that we are you know we are in the world um and i i what i worry about is that for um you know our younger men coming through that they just aren't quite sure how to be you know what they might see is their version of, of manly in the in this big social context that we now find ourselves in so i think yeah, we need to do a bit of work on that too, I think. We do, because how do you compensate for that? If somebody's idea of the way the world needs to be is the man needs to have charge, complete 100% control, final say, everything in the family, how do you how do you guide somebody that it's okay if that's not 100% the case and other people have a right to say something? How do you... How do you move beyond that? What I mean, it's an insecurity, obviously, but what do, can you do in the face of that? Well, it's really hard, I think, um, because if that's their their world view and they've constructed their whole world and their social circle and their private lives and their work lives around um, reinforcing that, the only evidence they're getting in the world is that that's what they need to be and that's what they can be. And so for me, it's probably about showing them that there's other, showing them other evidence to counteract that view of the world that they have. And, and I think that's where the, the struggle and the tension and the emotion comes into play on both sides of that conversation. But you've got to feel safe and, um, and supported to have those conversations. And I guess that's the point at which um, people might come to a psychologist to help um, navigate and guide them and support them through those difficult conversations that they're a bit afraid to either think about or confront or have that conversation about with um, you know with someone else out there in the world. Yeah, that was where I was going with it because it's kind of like if you tell somebody they there's got to be a feeling of well you're wrong now mm. you know for people who think that you're wrong which means yeah. You're wrong can be is life threatening to most of us. <laughs> well, I don't feel I don't feel good about being wrong. <laughs> like it's especially when you're my age. But you're like I think no, no, I'm right. But I think that's um, you know that's what I'm loving about a lot of the conversations that are happening out there in the world right now about um, you know about gender and about um, culture and about all of those um, really important um, you know about climate is that where you, in order to participate fully. Um, it, it's really important to be open and you can still be a bit right. You don't have to rock your whole foundation, but just add other perspectives into that rightness about the world. And I think if we took that perspective, we'd, um, uh, you know, we'd maybe get ahead a bit a bit quicker and be a, a, a bit nicer to each other. That's really interesting. Now, that's a great way of looking at it, that it's not that you're wrong, you're just adding more rightness to your yeah. worldview. Talk to me about that. Because that would just <laughs> so help people with adaptability, wouldn't it? Yeah. Being yeah. okay with things. Yeah. Well, and I think so first of all, I think um, you've got to be okay with not having all the answers. And <laughs> and I'm now very okay at my age because I don't have all the answers. But I think um, so I think that's right. And I think um, what I've loved about my trajectory through life is that I've been, you know, fortunate enough to be able to go to uni and to um, do research and that's um, and to be just curious and interested about the world and to have education experiences and work experience that's, that allow me to be curious and interested in the world and I wonder if you know when when as kids like we're interested and curious about the world and so that's what I love about you know being around young people is because they still have that curiosity and and interest in the world and I, I feel like that that's the ticket so you don't instead of having to be right all the time or have all the right answers if you're just curious and interested enough 
in what's going on around you and in your life and in yourself to keep asking questions, um, then then maybe that is the way to be a bit more right. It's interesting because as you're saying that, I'm thinking to back to my time because I've got four kids as a mum. And when you're raising the kids, when until they're a certain age, you kind of, they think, I remember one of my kids saying, did you used to be a teacher, mummy? Because you know everything. <laughs> That's the role you take on, isn't yes. it? And although you say, I'm, I, I actually don't know, I'm not sure about that, let's talk our way through it or I'll find out, you are expected to know everything. And yes. so you, you become, I'm talking about me here, you, oh, get, me into the, you get into the habit of um so it's kind of like you get into the habit of just making pronouncements <laughs> because it's a lot easier than entering into it. Also, like I remember with um, with our kids um, getting, especially with our, um, of course, our first, um, but baby vomited all over the ground and I was looking around for who might come in and help me clean it up and, you know, my hubby was asleep and I'm like, oh, I'm the responsible adult in the room here. It's me. <laughs> Do it. And so necessarily you have to be the responsible adult in the room. And that can happen in, um, you know, at all sorts of times in relationships, in the workplace and, you know, out in society. You look around and you're the responsible adult in the room. So there are times when you do need to be in control um, and you do need to have answers or at least a way forward and you're looked to for those um, for those things. Um, and I think along, so that's good and I think it's important and it's adaptive as you've just, um, you've just indicated. And I think the the important and to that is and don't assume that that's always going to be the case in all situations for all time. It, it's one of the learnings that I've had, particularly over the last 10 years as my kids have all grown up and left home, is get back into the habit of learning as opposed to knowing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's interesting that it does learning gives you a different perspective on the world to knowing. And I, I like to try lots of things on jack of all trades but what you said earlier the more I learn the more I realize the less I know that's right it's very humbling isn't it (laughs) I know nothing about anything really you know and that's and I'm actually okay with that yeah now and 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 that's just something and maybe it's because I'm okay with certainty. You know, where does certainty come into all this as well? Because that's another thing. People look for certainty, don't they? They do. Yeah, and that comes back to the that predict being able to predict, um, you know, and understand people. And so I think from my perspective, certainty isn't about control. I mean, it is a bit about control, but it's not about knowing what the outcome's going to be. But it's it's kind of having that certainty and, and maybe resilience and a bit of confidence in myself that I've got the skills and strategies probably that I need to be able to make the uncertain a bit more certain, if that makes sense. Mm. And I and I think that that does come with age and experience. Um, but I think that's what our young people, particularly after having come through coming through COVID and all of the uncertainty, probably need a bit bit more time and a bit more input around. Talking of that, it's interesting watching the difference that COVID had on my four kids. You know, I've got a oh, nice right. little, little group there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But four different personalities who dealt with it well and who didn't deal with it quite so well, you know, who's got the lasting, lingering impact. And my youngest was going through year 11 and 12 during COVID and she was at boarding school in New South Wales and we're in Queensland so we have problems getting her across the border every time she came home there was all sorts of things but she's an adaptable kind Mm. of personality so she handled it a lot better than some of the others would have done for example so how do we communicate that it's okay (laughs) not know yeah, and so I think, you know, and even and because we have not been able to do all like you know, a lot of normal things over COVID, like, you know, go outside the house, hang out with friends, go shopping, um, travel, which are relatively usual things to do in your day. And we've been told for necessarily that we can't do those things because they're unsafe. That for, for someone like me who's had a whole lifetime of doing all of those things, that two years was just a little blip and there was a context and I knew, you know, I know, know why. But for people who haven't had 
that life experience possibly. And so they've had things they thought were safe labelled as unsafe. I think coming out of COVID, there can be a real an understandable want and need to, to not do things anymore, to, to keep safe because you're just uncertain about the world in a pretty big and existential way. And for young people, that that stuff doesn't usually happen until, you know, 30, 40 years old where you go through that, oh, my gosh, here I am in this big world and I'm, you know, a very small part of it kind of thing. But what I worry about is that people, you know, this really critical point in young people's lives, they're not engaging in in some of the, I don't know, safe risk-taking behaviours that can build them the resilience and the confidence they need to bring the certainty around um, in their lives as adults. And so I think as, um, you know, as parents, if we have, um, you know, younger kids at home, still in, you know, now encouraging and maybe forcing them to get involved outside of their comfort zones um, is, a, is a really important thing to be doing, knowing and giving them a bit of success at doing that early on is a really important pathway out of the last couple of years just to help them get back into that um, what is a normal kind of, um, I guess, adolescent young person way of being in the world. Yeah, it's a really hard one, isn't it? I'm just, sorry, my mind's going all over the place there and I don't want to give any specific examples here because I don't want to embarrass anybody, you know. Mm. Um, It's not appropriate. This is a public forum. I'm not going to do it. But it's how do you do that? Like if somebody was stuck at home let's say they were working away or they were at university in a different state or something like that away from home and they were stuck there how do you then support them in moving beyond that that it's okay because I've never considered that at that point in time that experience is going to be or could be defining for the rest of your life yep never occurred to me yep So it it might not be, but it might be. It might be, yeah. There's the potential for it depending, and and it goes back to this optimism, pessimism, uh, uh, adaptability. It goes back to all that kind of thing in your personality, doesn't it? Yep. And so I think, um, and so for me it kind of comes back to uh, maybe how we might work with people who are highly anxious. So anxiety is about, you know, um, not feeling safe in the world. Um, and trying to develop strategies to help feel safe and in control in the world. And sometimes when, you know, anxiety is about those strategies when they're all together, uh, aren't getting you closer to where you want to be in the world and not making you feel good. They're not, you know, making you do the things that you really want to do. And so that's when we kind of go, well, let's have a look at what those strategies are and see, you know, what's driving them and are there anything, is there anything different? And so I think Part of the way we potentially can help is by having these conversations with um, with those people that we might be be worried about, or even if we're not worried about them, but talking out loud that process of how you might adapt to the world, um, encouraging people to um, try things, even if their feelings, um, uh, if they're feeling anxious, you can still do things and have feelings about it, which comes back to the gaslighting, which is like the opposite of what um, people do when they're gaslighting. And so you don't have to have all the answers before you try something out. And and could we be a bit curious and interested and open to there being a different outcome if you try that activity than the one you think you're going to get? Um, and so some specific really simple examples would be, um, I don't know, just giving, if, so I've got younger kids, so my examples are going to be younger. You know, I might get our kids to make dinner for me, for us, for the night, which is tricky. There's lots of things to do, um, but there's support around. It's probably going to work out. It's for mum and dad. We're going to um, really enjoy what you cook no matter what, but it's just pushing their comfort zone a little bit um, to have to do that. And so then maybe there are there are lots of, there are other examples that are more relevant for, um, you know, for people who are, who are a bit older, whereby it might just seem like an everyday thing to us, but it, it can be just a safe pushing the boundary experience a little bit just to help people get back on that path of, of just of checking out the world for what it holds for us. Um, so it might be if someone's at uni, you know, instead of going to online courses all the t- online subjects all the time, go one a week in person. Try, you know, maybe you're going to catch the bus once a week instead of going in the car or walking. So just doing little things that you know are probably going to go all right. Um, it's it's equally as likely that it'll go right, even more likely than than wrong. 
and let's test that out and do a little experiment to see what happens if we um, if we actually try it rather than sort of sitting at home going, I know I don't want to do that because I know it's going to make me feel uncomfortable and it's going to be awful and I'm not going to want to do that anymore. It's just sort of just testing out, being curious and interested in testing out the assumptions that we make about the world. This is really relevant to everything because I hadn't considered everything we're talking about here is based on anxiety, isn't it? Different kinds of anxiety, the Mm. gaslighting, the adaptability, the optimism, pessimism, all of it. Mm. It is. Yeah, I hadn't considered that. It is. And I think so anxiety is a really great label. We've already talked about labels and labels can be really helpful. And I think what's even more helpful is is looking at and understanding what we mean by anxiety and and how that might be playing out in our lives. Um, So it might help for people to know that the cluster of things they're experiencing belong in an anxiety disorder group. But really more important is understanding how what what people are thinking and feeling in that context and how we might be able to, I don't know, rewire or, or, or re-strategize about, um, you know, how to live with those feelings. Okay, let's let's do a little sidestep here. Stigma about being anxious. Mm. <laughs> Not necessarily from society, although it is, but like labels, again, you wouldn't necessarily want to label yourself or consider yourself an anxious per- person, particularly not to anybody outside yourself but also within yourself and yeah how do we deal with that side of things that's well I think um so labels it's really I love talking about labels um and psychologists are really good at putting labels on everything um even you know simple things like thinking we go ooh, cognition (laughs) and thinking about thinking is metacognition like really anyway not now um it's just but in some sense, labels are a way to, labels can be pretty invalidating and, and we just saw that, you know, you're gaslighting uh, me and I'm not going to enter into anything um, around that when you go, well, actually, no, that's not what's happening and can we have a talk about that? No. Um, and so sometimes it can be um, people can get a label and they can, and it can bring a sense of relief because it just gives them a way to make sense of the experiences that they're having. And I think that's when, um, you know, when the labels are applied appropriately, then that's um, certainly what happens. But when they're not applied um, appropriately, or sometimes if they're self-applied or, you know, or whatever, you know, or on the internet, you do a quiz and you label, you know, I think um, that's when we get into some trouble because it can be quite invalidating. It can raise stigma around behaviours that, that you know, exist on a bit of a spectrum that might not be disorders. It might just be, oh, this is how I, this is my style of being in the world and how can I make it work for me, not against me, as opposed to being labelled, oh, you've got an anxiety disorder that needs to be treated. And sometimes when when people get a label, um, they think that that's the end, people can think that's the end point. So that's as I've got, I can't do this because I've got anxiety. Or you can't do this because you've got anxiety. And I think that's where this either the self-stigma or the stigma from the rest of the, the community in the world comes in. And that can be really awful to experience um, and really limiting in, in what options and opportunities are available to you in the world. Yeah, I, I was when one of my kids was quite young in, in about year two, and they wanted the teachers came to me and said, we think that they've got ADHD and we want to get them assessed. And I was like, no, because at that age, you are not going to stick a label on them. Mm. You're just not. And one of my other kids since then has actually gone on to get themselves diagnosed with ADHD because that works for them. But it gives them a context for how to handle themselves and the world around them it doesn't give a label for other people to say this is what you're capable of doing and I think that's the problem with labels I do too and so it's not to say that lab that you know going and getting a diagnosis is bad at all for the reasons you've just described so I'm really glad um, that you've had that experience but a better question to ask, you know, in the context of a, you know, someone in year two is, well, what are the behaviours that, that are the problem? What, what are we seeing that's, um, you know, not working for, um, you know, my child or for the, the student in the class? And what are all the reasons why that might be happening? And can we work out a plan to to deal with, to help that person manage their behaviour better? 
and maybe over time that that those behaviours might not be able to be self managed, and maybe that's when a diagnosis and other sorts of treatment options might be um, might be required. But certainly, the starting point is not the label. <laughs> the starting point should yeah. be what what are the things that are happening that are not working for me and for others. Yeah, it's interesting because in that scenario, I took the child out of a state school, a normal state school. He's exceptionally bright, like ridiculously clever. And that was part of the problem. So I put the kids into a Montessori school and it worked brilliant because they could just do what they wanted to do, do maths for three months, that was it, and they were happy and then they'd move on to something else. But when he was in year three, that child, he was doing year seven and eight work. Mm -hmm at the Montessori school, that Um, was what he needed to do. He was just bored out of his brain. So it's just, I don't know, for me it was more about there's nothing wrong. Find out who you are and what your needs are so that we can cater to those needs. And he was one of, I've always thought of his intelligence, you know when you see those teenagers that are kind of going from their pre-teens to teens and they've not quite got control of all their extremities you watch them run and they look like a scarecrow on speed there's like elbows and knees everywhere that was what he was like with his intelligence and his personality he didn't have control of the extremities of it he's only just getting on top of it now that's how it felt to me and it was about teaching him to be okay with who he is and being able to to um, make the most of it. There's nothing wrong. This is what you've been given. You've got massive talents. Now work with them. That's and- right. And make it work for you and not against yeah. you because we do have to exist in a world and in a social world and there are different contexts where there are different expectations of us and that doesn't mean that we all have to be the same cookie cutter per- like cookie cutter type of person. We all have our uniqueness that we're bringing into our situations and we just need to understand ourselves well enough to make it work for us, not against us. Mm. It was all about as well, because I've always said to the kids, we're all weirdos, just yeah. you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> and but you need also need to be able to have the option to function in society if you choose. You don't have to, but I want to give you you need have the to option. understand yeah. the rules so that mm-hmm. you can do that if you if yeah. you want to do that. And I've completely forgotten where I was going with that training. <laughs> well, that's making it work, I think, work making the world work for you and you work for the world rather than it all being against you. Yeah, yeah and it's also not about being the same as everybody else because that's the other thing with anxiety is having struggled with anxiety on and off my whole life. Mm. You go, oh, my God, you start comparing yourself to everybody yeah. else. I'm not like that. I'm not like them. I don't do things. I'm not normal. I'm not normal. <laughs> well, that's right. And we, but we're programmed to 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 judge and to judge discrepancies, and whether that's between what we internally think and feel about ourselves versus what the outside world thinks, how we're doing relative to the Joneses next door, or people on maths, or people on social media, and we're programmed to to judge and make judgments about the world, and then to judge how far or close we are to that other person or experience. And, of course, we only ever really look at the outside and it's often our own <laughs> mirrors that we're putting on other people and reflecting back to us that we're, we're being judgmental about, which is really interesting about that gaslighting maps person, I might add. But, um, um, but yes, I think it's, it's part of what we do naturally as human beings. And, again, we want to make sure that it's working for us and not against us. You don't remove it. It's, it's really, really valuable. Anxiety is really valuable in many situations because it's a, it helps us be a bit more cautious and a bit more um, thoughtful about the way we approach interactions, but it doesn't necessarily have to stop us from doing all of those things that are out there in the world. So, again, it's that balance, I think. Judge, I, sorry, I'm just looking at the time. What time do you need to go? Oh, gosh. I could talk forever. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I don't could... know. That's I could too. That's fine. We could always do a second. <laughs> uh, about ten, I need to get going about quarter past if that's all right. So about 10 more minutes. Let's, yeah, let's like start wrapping it up in about five minutes and that'll mm-hmm. give us time and everything. So how do you create that balance? Because most of us, I suppose this desire not to get things wrong, to get it right, we would naturally want to avoid situations where we're a bit anxious. Because mm, that could, 
Yeah. That could be a sign that this is all wrong and I really don't need to yeah. do that. So I don't have it right, by the way. I <laughs> muck up constantly, just ask my kids as much as I go work and Marby uh, and me. So I think a focus on, on effort and the process rather than the outcome is really important. So, um, and that we need to be prepared to try irrespective of the outcome is something that we probably need to reward and, and think about and give ourselves rewards for, irrespective of whether the outcome is what we've predicted or what we've wanted or gives us accolades and, uh, you know, and status and those sorts of things. And so I think that's a, a big part of it. And I think the second part of it is um, not always second guessing ourselves, but just accepting that our first thought about a situation isn't the only thought that you can have, isn't the only one to have about that situation. And just being curious enough to go, oh, I'm feeling this way. Is there another way to look at that? Is there, you know, what would my mum say? What would my friends say? What would my partner say? What would my kids say about that situation? And try to um, entertain other ways of thinking about that situation than the one that we've automatically jumped to. Because if we're feeling anxious and stressed and, and feeling low in our mood and so forth, we can tend to jump to the more, I guess, negative or pessimistic interpretations of situations just by virtue of the way we're feeling. And that's okay, um, except uh, um, when we don't just question if that's the most likely to be true in that situation or if there are other ways of looking at those situations. That's really interesting because I don't do that. I just, whatever I'm thinking is the right way. That's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> I rarely go, okay, how could I look at it? Like I was invited to do some public speaking. I went into a complete meltdown. It was something that I know I should probably have a go at, but it never occurred to me to go, okay, so what would a friend or somebody who's really good at public speaking, what would they how would they approach it? And what would yeah, they and think? Is, you know, would the, and is that about? just as likely to be true to happen as what I'm thinking is going to happen? And I think that's, but that's how we train our brain, I think, to be curious and interested. And then, because of course, if you did that for everything that you encountered, you'd be absolutely bloody exhausted by the end of every day. Um, but that's, I think, how you build, I feel, that build that kind of resilient, adaptive mindset that helps you Helps the work, helps you work and function and operate in the world, and and lets all of those experiences and thoughts of feelings that make us our beautiful, unique selves work for us rather than against us. Well, I think that's about time to wrap up. Thank you <laughs> so much. I've just had the best time. This thing. So have I. I feel like I've just rambled on, and I haven't been helpful at all. But I hope <laughs> no, you I've really enjoyed having a chat. Yeah, no, it's been great. So do I just direct people to your website? Do people contact you or have you got like a media page or something? Sure. Um, so people can contact me by email if they like, and I think my email is on the Google form if they yeah, want is, yeah. information, if they want to find out about some of the projects and studies that we're, we're doing at, um, at HMRI, they can certainly do that. I can also let you I'd send you a, um, a list of things if people are feeling like they need a bit of help or um, anxious feelings, depression, feelings of depression, those sorts of things, I can send you some um, other websites that can help connect people to, to treatment and to, to care. And also if you're a family member or friend who's got a loved one with anxiety or depression, we've got some stuff that um, that I can send through as well that can help you with that. If um, So I don't know if that's all helpful, um, as well as providing my email Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been for this awesome. opportunity. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and don't forget to rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you're leaving with some thought-provoking information that can make a difference in your life. See you next time.